don't talk about anything you're not allowed to talk about, obviously, but from what you can tell us, what did your job consist of? Is there a specific area in the world where you were? Were you all over the place? What were you doing minus exact missions? Like yeah. what types of work so I was going on? Yeah, I specialized in Asia. So, and that's about as specific as I can be publicly okay. right now. And um, I spoke Chinese coming out of college. And then I picked up Japanese and I picked up Thai um, and... Yeah, Japanese and Thai while I was at the agency to help expand my capabilities throughout that whole region. Because those are all those are all strong, uh, important languages to have throughout the Asian region. And wherever you wherever I was you were somewhere. You weren't here. Correct. Wherever I was, my objective was always focused on Asia. Because I mean, with especially with countries like China and with businesses out of Japan and with um Thai is much more focused on on the region of Southeast Asia, but you'll find Japanese people and Chinese people, and you'll find Asians in general all over the world doing all sorts of things. So oftentimes the way, just like you wouldn't go in the front door to break into someone's house, usually you go in a window or a side door or you break into the garage. It's the same, the same approach in intelligence. You don't like, if you want to collect intelligence against, you name a country, Russia, yes, you could go into Russia and take your chances in Moscow (laughs) or you go through on a different way. You go to Belarus, right? You go to Moldova. You go to... You Crete. Know, yeah. Yeah. You go somewhere else where they're not paying so much attention, where the alarm isn't quite so loud or where the door might be left open. Where you can find targets. Where you, you can, can find relevant targets because it's not like all Russian people stay in Russia. You yeah, know? exactly right. Even more important, you're going to the place where you can find a target that has access... Yes. ...and a vulnerability that you can exploit. Right? Somebody who has access but no vulnerabilities, never going to give you secrets. Somebody who has access and some kind of vulnerability, now you've got, you've got the one-two punch that you need to have a chance, a higher probability of collecting intelligence from a future, what we would call a future recruited asset. So a main part of your job was recruiting assets. That is the job. The job is collecting intelligence, but you can't collect direct, high-value, high-quality intelligence unless you're recruiting a source that understands their purpose is to provide secrets of a certain caliber. So everything before that is secrets of a lesser caliber. Is there like a schedule that goes into this? <laughs> like at all? Are, are you waking up like, all right, at 9 a.m. I'm going to go to the coffee shop and I'm going to exploit that person I've been looking at for a week? Or is this just more you are trained viciously by the CIA to be able to do all these things before you actually go out to do it and then you're on your own and figure it out? No, there's, you are trained rigorously to follow a schedule. That's a, the schedule is, if you, if you, if you want to look up the skirt and be totally like, what, spoiler alert. Let's look up. Right. If you want to, if you want to see how hairy the bush is under the skirt, <laughs> the schedule is about nine months. It usually takes about nine months for a valid target to go from stranger who you've never talked to before to providing secrets to you in exchange for something of value to them. But how often is it you identifying who that target is because you're on the ground versus being told ahead of going there like, oh, we see this guy, that guy, that girl, whatever. Yeah, so that's that's a trickier question. It's probably two out of three where you you just live your life actively and you find the people yourself through the good old-fashioned networking, handshaking, high-fiving kind of lifestyle. Can I paint a scenario here yeah. and see if you can fill this out? All right. So I send you, Agent Bustamante, to, let's say I send you to Paris, France, okay. little big city. Okay. So this, this is easier because you know there's a lot of people there, big population, international city. And your overall mission is you need to cultivate assets for the United States to have further intelligence on the influence of, let's go with a present day kind of thing, Russian politics in the European spectrum outside of Russia. Okay. Your plane lands, you get there, you're given funding for staying somewhere and all that shit. But what happens next? So most likely before I ever, before I ever took off in a plane, somebody gave me two or three dossiers, right? So somebody gave me places to start. Um, politicians, local businessmen, whatever. But the problem is, I don't, like, what am I going to go knock on the door and say, <laughs> hey, I got your dossier. My name's Andy, you know, or Andres or 
<laughs> Antonio or whatever my name is, right? So that that's the problem. So that's that's where movies get it wrong. So what ends up having, having to happen is you actually do have to cultivate from the ground up. So if I know that my dossier, my dossier gives me somebody with access and a vulnerability. So I know that there is one, whatever, German guy in Paris that has both access and a vulnerability, but I got to find my way to him. And what could his vulnerability be? Maybe he's got a sick kid, a kid that, that is very, has an illness that's rare, very expensive to treat. And that's why he's in France, because France is one of only three countries in the world that might be able to treat it. Or maybe the guy's an alcoholic. And if his alcoholism becomes known by his business or by the company he works for, he's going to get fired because Germans don't like it when people have substance abuse or issues. Or he gets a Dewey. Yeah. Yeah, whatever it might be, right? So they have some kind of vulnerability that we can leverage. To find that person, you have to cultivate them in the exact same social way that we used to cultivate friendships and get dates and everything else, right? You go to interesting places, talk to interesting people, do interesting things. That's 90% of a spy's life is just going out, doing cool stuff with cool people in cool places, trying to find other interesting people doing the same thing. Putting yourself in the situation, basically. Saying, all right, let's go. And then immediately assessing every person that you meet. Like that's, that's the, the, the true magic power of espionage is being able to essentially in real time, uh, manage or manipulate, but we call it managing, man, manage a relationship by knowing this person likes X, Y, Z, their high energy, their low energy, high probabilities of what their personal life looks like, what their romantic life looks like, probabilities of whatever else it might be, right? That from substance abuse to... Uh, porn addictions to liking to go out and play sports. And then as you assess these people in real time, you're also assessing what is the capacity that they have for an interesting network? What are the chances that this cab driver actually has somebody in their immediate network, friends, college, graduate friends, whatever else, who might be of interest? And then as you find people who have high probabilities, you manage those relationships with a little bit more time and effort to expand on that network and leverage the network to build your way like a ladder to get to that German guy. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.